I'd like to welcome you all to this open set first open session of the meeting of the committee to evaluate the process to develop the dietary guidelines for Americans 2020 to 25. Um, as chair and uh, of this meeting, I'd like to um, uh, <clears throat> thank you and uh, to welcome everyone. The task being undertaken by this um, committee of the National Academies um, is a comparative analysis. Um, there are three parts to that analysis, the scientific methodologies, review protocols, and evaluation processes used to develop the most recently issued dietary guidelines as compared to recommendations included in the 2017 report titled, Redesigning the Process for Establishing the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. We might be referring to that as the prior report. Uh, secondly, the scientific studies used to develop the dietary guidelines to determine the dietary needs of Americans with diet-related metabolic diseases compared to the most current and rigorous scientific studies on diet and diet-related metabolic diseases available. And third, how implementation of the recommendations would have affected the most recently issued guidelines. What I've read to you is the task for this committee. In addition, I want to note that this is an open on the record session. Interested individuals have been invited to attend as observers and will, we will um, or will not be entertaining uh, questions from the floor as um, I decide as the um, uh, conversation uh, moves forward. At the moment, it's not, but we'll see. I would also like to remind everyone that this is an information gathering session that is, the committee is in the process of assembling materials that it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions, we've just started, and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here today thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the National Academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may or may not be indicative of personal views. The committee will, deliberately thir will deliberate thoroughly before writing its final report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, it must go through rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee. And the committee must then report to this, to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's report review committee and the chairman of the National Research Council before it is committed, considered an NRC report. And with that, I would like to introduce um, Eve Esri Studi, uh, the designated federal officer and director, Center for the uh, Nutrition Policy and Promotion of the Food and Nutrition Service at USDA. Dr. Studi, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Janet DeJesus, the Nutrition Advisor in the Division of Preventive Science, Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion um, in the Department of Health and Services. Dr. DeJesus, thank you for joining us. And Stephanie Fu, the Senior Policy Advisor in the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion in the USDA. And Dr. Fu, thank you for joining us. Um, I believe that Dr. Uh, Studi will have some remarks for us to start with. So um, floor is yours. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Asmussen. And um, can someone just nod or give me a thumbs up that we're good on the slides and you can hear me? Lovely. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and first, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to the members of the committee. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with three different dietary guidelines advisory committees, as well as we've um, several technical ex expert collaboratives as part of our systematic review process. And know that y'all have full lives to begin with. <laughs> so thank you for taking on yet another task. And we really uh, appreciate in advance the, the information and, and the time that you'll spend on this study. So what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Asmussen just went through the task. Um, and I'm going to go through it a little bit more detail, talk about the study, kind of about a, um, what the ask is. Um, but a lot of what we want would like is um, to spend some time hearing questions from you, and particularly um, at the end, um, I'll kind of set it up the task, but one of the things we're working on is a package of information for the committee uh, 
so that, you know, you can't help us unless you know what we're doing or what we've done. And so really listening to the questions that you have uh, that would be helpful in conducting this work. So Janet, um, as you mentioned, will be is on the line and she'll be addressing questions with me. But in some cases, we may take your question and say that, you know, we'll add that to the, the documentation that we're preparing. So um, this being we really want to be a resource for y'all and um, this being the first step at being that source. So I'm going to walk through um, about a dozen slides. I'm going to start off. Uh, if you're on this call, you likely have familiarity with the dietary guidelines, uh, but the dietary guidelines do provide food-based guidance designed to promote health and prevent diet-related chronic diseases. Uh, we create the dietary guidelines um, we are mandated to create the dietary guidelines from the National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act of 1990. Uh, we've created guidance since 1980. Every five years, the 1990 Act uh, really set that into law, a regular updating system. And uh, the National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act requires the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health and Human Services to partner in that development. And uh, Janet, who is on this call with me, co-led the 2020, uh, the development of the 2020 dietary guidelines. Uh, the latest edition was released in December of this year. And the tagline for this edition is to make every bite count with the dietary guidelines. Uh, in this edition, we took a life stage approach and we have guidance for infants through older adulthood. Uh, and this is the first edition, the early, early editions did have some information for infants, uh, but this is the first edition and many editions that uh, included the birth to 24 month population. So it's a little bit of background about this particular study. Um, in 2016, Congress did direct USDA to engage the National Academies to conduct a study of the process used to establish the dietary guidelines. So we've been creating guidance since 1980. That process has evolved over that time. And in, in 2016, Congress said, okay, let's pause and let's assess that overall process. And so we have representation on the, from that committee on this committee Committee. Um, that study culminated in two reports, and each of those reports provided recommendations to the Departments of Agriculture and Health and Human Services for consideration and planning our processes for future editions of the guidelines. So the first report was on optimizing the process for establishing the guidelines, and that was really focused on our process. We work with an external advisory committee, so that report really talked about uh, recommendations for forming that committee. The second report was for the rest of the process, and that is the focus for this study, uh, so the second study. So that report was entitled Redesigning the Process for Establishing the Dietary Guidelines. So after those reports, and actually as those reports were wrapping up, we were beginning the 2020 process and we refined our process for developing the dietary guidelines in response to those recommendations. I will also note that we do, it's set in law that this is a regular process and we do have a continuous quality advancement process that's built in already. Um, we, for all elements of our process, I mean, we learn from what we did the last round. Uh, we do follow what's happening in guidance development and try to advance with those methodologies. And so we had already some quality advancement activities in place uh, that were used to inform our 2020 process. We also had stakeholder feedback uh, that informed our process. And our emphasis this last round was to support a transparent, inclusive, and science-driven process. The latest edition of the Dietary Guidelines, as I mentioned, was released in December of 2020. And then early 2021, Congress directed USDA to engage with the National Academies for this follow-up study. So this follow-up study is a 14-month study. It too will culminate in two reports, but they're very different than the two reports from the first committee. Um, and by that, I mean, for the first committee, there were two very distinct, like complete reports that were created. In this, for this study, we'll have a mid-course report and then a final report. 
And the intent of the mid-course report is to give us a sense for what your findings are, those analyses, as well as, as, well as um, the framework that will be used to develop your final report. Uh, we've asked for that to be completed by the end of this calendar year. And the reason for that is twofold. Uh, one is to meet a congressional mandate, uh, the mandate that um, required us to conduct this study required that it produce a report by the end of 2021. So this will allow us to meet that mandate, but also to inform our 2025 process. Uh, so we are already, we just released the guidelines in, at, in December of 2020, but already looking ahead to the next process. So um, as soon as we can get information and reaction, the more helpful it is as we plan, as we look ahead. So the intent of that, again, is to just kind of is, is a mid course. What are our initial findings, analyses, knowing that the full report will take uh, more work um, to fully flesh out and develop. And the timeline for the final report is uh, summer of next year, so about a year from now. Okay, so a description for this study is available on the National Academy's study page. Um, and it is essentially to compare the process that we use to develop the latest edition of the guidelines to the recommendations in that second report on redesigning the process for establishing the dietary guidelines. The mid-course and final reports uh, will include the committee's analyses, findings, and conclusions, um, but it's not intended, it's essentially intended to be a bookend to the first set of studies, um, not necessarily to produce new recommendations. However, we certainly do encourage and look for or welcome information or recommendations for future research and future directions. Um, I think in talking to the National Academies, developing re recommendations is almost like a somewhat of a different process. And so really thinking of this as a bookend versus a, another study to develop new recommendations. So when the Congress um, in the Consolidated Appropriations Act, when they uh, provided funding for this study, they did outline the scope of the study. And I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, the National Academies then asked USDA, and we worked with our partners at HHS, to provide more specific study questions for the committee in order to meet that congressional mandate. So in the next few slides, I'm going to give a little bit more detail about that specific scope and the specific study questions. And before I do that, I'll note um, for those who are not uh, familiar or haven't read recently the uh, second study from the first committee, um, redesigning the process for establishing the guidelines, that uh, report has seven recommendations. And those seven recommendations, um, just to briefly summarize, they make recommendations around the structure, number, and roles of expert advisory committees and technical panels that are involved in the development process. It makes recommendations, a lot of it is around the methodology that we use to review the evidence. And so our methodol methods now for reviewing the evidence include uh, conducting systematic reviews, doing food pattern modeling analyses, as well as uh, establish nutrients of public health concern. And so there are recommendations for each of those. They also have recommendations around providing transparency in the final guidelines and a recommendation to support future work to develop and implement systems approaches in developing the dietary guidelines. So that then brings us to the specific uh, study questions. And what you see on each of the next of the three, the next three slides, the top of the slide has the language that was from the um, Consolidated Appropriations Act that mandated the study. And the bottom of the slide provides the specific study question associated with that language. So the first element of the act was really, as we set it up, the purpose of the study is to compare the process that we use to develop the 2020 guidelines to that 2017 report on redesigning the process. And so for a specific question, we frame that as how did the process used to develop the latest edition of the guidelines? And that includes the scientific methodologies, the review protocols, and the evaluation processes 
compared to the seven recommendations in that second report. So that one's pretty straightforward. It's how, how did we implement or how did we integrate um, those recommendations into our process? The second uh, study question is really around our consideration of scientific research. And so this particular section requests a comparative analysis of the scientific studies used to develop the guidelines to determine the dietary needs of Americans with diet-related metabolic diseases as compared to the most current and rigorous scientific studies on diet and diet-related metabolic diseases available. So the way that we've, the, the question is really around the science base that we include to develop the dietary guidelines. Does the criteria that we use in identifying that research, does it allow us to identify an evidence base that is current, that is rigorous, and that is generalizable to informing public health guidance? And so this is really thinking about um, the criteria that we use in our systematic review methodology and ensuring that we are identifying the right studies to inform public health guidance. And then the third element of the study is an analysis of how full implementation of the recommendations from that first, uh, the seven recommendations from the second study or second report would have affected the most recently issued guidelines. So the question there is how would the process with full implementation of the second recommendations compared to the process that we use to develop the guidelines have affected the end result? And three of the elements that we're interested in getting reaction around is the timeline, the cost, and ultimately the integrity of the ultimate guidelines. And we're all in this, you know, we all wanna provide trustworthy worthy guidance. We wanna provide good information to the general public. So thinking about how those recommendations, uh, how full implementation of those recommendations, um, I will say we did a lot of work in um, considering all of the recommendations and the implementation of those. Um, would taking it fully, how would that have impacted the final guidance? I do want to note that this is an independent evidence-based analysis, and by that I mean uh, the Department of Agriculture and Health and Human Services are independent to the work of the committee. We are a resource for the committee, and we are really want to be there to answer any questions that the committee has. Um, the only element that we will see that, that will obviously attend and participate in the public meetings, um, we will also see the sections of the draft report that describe the process that the department used to develop the latest edition of the guidelines and we'll really just review that from a technical accuracy perspective so we won't be involved in um, seeing the findings of the committee's re uh, recommendations or their report until the public sees that as well so as i mentioned the, some of the core elements from uh, this latest edition of the guidelines was around uh, transparency and we did a lot of work to make the work of um, our development process transparent we launched a new website at dietaryguidelines.gov and i'll just say it, we hope that it's a really good resource for the committee uh, there is a section on our homepage. if you go to resources there's a link to about the process and it talks about the process that we used there you can see a direct link to the scientific report that was created by our external advisory committee. And there is, um, in relation to the report, we have a section at the bottom of, kind of at the bottom of the page, you see three blue tabs, and that's part of our report page where we have additional online materials related to data analysis, food pattern modeling, and systematic reviews. And so that talks about the methodology for each of those three processes. I'll also note that our systematic reviews have a dedicated website, and that's at nesser.usda.gov, and that's for our nutrition evidence systematic review team. Um, and if you've looked at that previous report, that was formerly, the Nesser was formerly known as NEL, or the Nutrition Evidence Library. Uh, so those things are the same thing, but um, renamed. So nesser.usda.gov has all of our information about the systematic reviews conducted by to support our dietary guidelines advisory committee including the full uh, systematic reviews for each of their questions 
Um, and if you go to the homepage, that's a, a screenshot of the homepage. It directly links you to the 2020 committee's work. I'll also note that on dietaryguidelines.gov, we have a page that uh, speaks to the National Academies, uh, the first study. Um, we have some information about how the departments have responded to the National Academies recommendations. Um, and I'll just note, as I mentioned earlier, we did consider, I mean, greatly considered the reports from the committee in this last process. Um, we have, I think the Federal Advisory Committee has about 1,000 advisory committees at any given time. And so we talked a lot with other kind of the implications of some of the recommendations for working with the advice with our advisory committee, you know, what kind of precedent that would set across USDA and HHS and working with other advisory committees. There's also a lot of rules about how we um, work with advisory committees. So we worked a lot with um, our office of um, general counsel, our office of ethics, um, our federal advisory committee office taking the recommendations from the committee and working with these different groups to see what we're, what is able for us to do, what are we able to do, what can we implement, um, and, and all that was a part of our process. And we, we do speak to some of that um, on our website now. And one of the things, as I mentioned, we're working on a package of materials that we'll provide to the National Academies, but also post on our website that'll provide more information. Um, what we have here is kind of up until the launch of the guidelines, and we want to expand that information to provide kind of full responses around the um, National Academy's report. And so more to come on that page, but there is some information there now. So with that, I will just say again, thank you. Um, and again, Janet is here with me. So I think the two of us are really welcome and happy to answer any questions you have. And again, really interested on, you know, hearing what uh, the intent of the study and those three different uh, study questions, if there are things that would be helpful for you in informing the study um, that we can work on over the next couple of weeks to get to you, that would be, um, we're happy to do that, would be interested in those questions. So thank you. All right, that unmutes me. Thank you, Alt-A, for those of you who need to be <laughs> unmuted. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Studi, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Uh, I'm gonna um, lead off with a question that arose out of what you said and then open the floor to the committee to um, ask the questions that they um, that are um, at the top of their mind. Um, in task two, it specifically asks for just diet related chronic diseases and not um, any other of the dietary guidelines. Can you tell us what the reason is for that, please? It's so why does the study language only reference diet related metabolic diseases? Um, I, I mean, we didn't, I'll just, we didn't write the original, the act language, but I know that there has been a lot of interest in the fact that the majority of American adults have one or more diet related chronic disease. Um, the National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act uh, says that the departments are to create guidance for the general public. And as the general public, we do see higher prevalence of diet-related chronic diseases. Are the guidelines accurately including evidence to inform public health guidance for all Americans? So I think the their focus on the diet-related metabolic diseases to, is to get you know reaction around: Are we doing? Is the research that we're doing? Is the approach that we're um, examining the evidence adequate to address the needs of the general public? That is changing. Okay. Uh, the reason I asked is because a new inclusion in this round was pregnant women, lactating women, and infants and children under two. Um, who are also groups of great interest, but for many of them, the level of information was quite limited. So you're telling me that that wasn't the reason. Uh, the reason seems to be congressional interest. 
and the precedent of the um, Nutrition Monitoring Act. Thank you. Um, members of the committee, as you have questions, Kathy Ross. Yes. Uh, first, first of all, thank you, Dr. Studi, for pointing out which of the language in this statement of task came directly from the, uh, you know, the federal mandate, and then how you translated it into, into mm -hmm. study questions for us. So that's it's helpful to see that side by side. In terms of of the first two um, uh, tasks, you know, both say a comparative analysis. So we have. We have information from the prior report, the 2017 report for the, the seven recommendations, et cetera. But can we talk a little bit more about what's going to be available in the way of data or evidence to compare the process that was used for the dietary guidelines? In other words, we have the dietary guidelines, but we might not have full insight into the process by which we got there. So what, what do you propose that you'll be presenting to us or, or that we should go out and dig up for ourselves you know, to help, help fill that in? So what we're working on on our side, and I'll say um, we, we do have information about the committee's review of the evidence already on our website, but we are also doing a, a document that indicate here was the recommendation and kind of a response to the recommendation. So I think there'll be a few, many different things, but um, I think the information, the committee's scientific report is extensive on how they, how that work was conducted. The reviews found at nesser.usda.gov or provide every level of detail around the criteria that were used in those reviews. Um, we can do some summary information on that uh, to kind of collapse it because there's a lot of questions at Nesser's website. But one of the things we are working on is literally a question in response for each of the seven recommendations. Mm -hmm. But again, I think for our discussion today, if there are specific questions you have around, so we'll work on, I mean, we are working on that and we'll share that if there's something that we hear today that we can integrate into that. We're happy to do that. Um, we're also happy to, we'll provide that. And like I said, we'll post on our website. If it sparks new questions, um, those can be facilitated to us and happy to expand that document as well. But our intent is to prepare, prepare a document that's literally here was the recommendation and here's what the departments did for in this round of developing the dietary guidelines. Mm -hmm. So, um, we have some process, uh, some uh, questions that might out well be answered on the website. So the last time I used the dietary guidelines website was to prepare a lecture I gave probably in March. And many of the things that you just walked us through were not present at the time, or at least I didn't look in the right place. Um, so um, Esther, um, you had uh, a question that follows directly on this, and then I'll get to Kelly. Okay, so uh, my question, um, Eve, is uh, several times in the documentation, there was request for continuous improvement approach to the uh, process. And you indicated that there was a continuous a quality improvement or continuous advancement um, process or program in place. Can you, exp or could you provide us more information about what, what that looks like? Um, so, for example, what process measures do you monitor? And um, I'm assuming that over the time there would have been specific pieces of the process that maybe you did an in-depth study on and modified, and so that those things were improved and changed between the time period that we're talking on. And then kind of as a follow-up to that is, if that is true, that there's things that you looked at and improved, then is there any way for us to understand, like, which of the systematic review questions were completed using one process as opposed to maybe an updated process for some of those that came later on? So I'll just uh, briefly say that our continuous quality advancement activities, we have a different layers of it. Um, after we work with a committee, we do an after action with the committee um as well as with our staff and kind of um 
how literally how could we have worked and done a process better? Um, we also follow what is happening in the systematic review world. Um, we are, our nutrition evidence systematic review team has interest groups that monitor what's happening in grading the evidence or assessing risk of bias, um, all of the different elements around systematic review. So that work is ongoing and continuous. Um, I will also just add that so we have our nutrition evidence team, we have our food pattern modeling team um, who are continuing to work to update and advance methodologies. Um, also on our guidance side, I mean, there is recommendations for informing or developing guidance. Um, so really maintaining and monitoring what is happening, what's happening in international guidance development. So that's just kind of at a high level, we do it in a number of different ways. But I think what, um, thanks for asking the question, I think we can kind of give more documentation around that um, in what we're preparing. Um, I'll also say that in the, for the first study, we can prepare documentation that kind of talked about examples of how the process has changed over time as a result of this activity that might be helpful. So we can definitely expand on that in the documentation that we're working on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Kelly. Hi, thanks very much for the presentation. It was very helpful. And the question I have has to do with context. So certainly our committee will be dealing with what has occurred. Um, you know, ha here are the criteria, have they been met or have they not? That's all pretty clear. But the question is, are, are, are the why questions going to be important as well? So like if, if the criteria were met under one set of circumstances around one question, but but less so in another case. Should we comment on why that might have been the case? Did the committee make the best use of information it had available, or did it make the best decision and why that might have been the case? So I'm wondering if those context factors might be helpful in interpreting what happened as well as just stating what happened. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think there is often a rationale. So, you know, yes, it may have been, I, I do think there's a fair amount of consistency, but absolutely. Um, so I, we're, and I'll say we have these specific study questions, but I think we're also, I mean, we're all in this to continue to advance the process. And if there's input that the committee has around that, um, whether it's, you know, specifically outlined, I think we would be very, open to receiving that input. And I'll just say, um, Janet, I know you're on, but I know these Zoom calls are sometimes hard. So Janet, is there anything that you wanna to add to any of the questions or from the remarks that we provided um, that you'd like to add? Sure, thanks, Eve. Yeah, just going back to the question about the comparative um, analysis, I mean, that was language from the act. So that was why when we, um, Kind of redid that question looking at how did the process compare to the recommendations from the NASM committees we tried to make that a little more clear so so we agree that some of the act language um, was a little bit unclear and just to add um, on the question about you know continuous improvement you know just echo everything um, Eve said I mean all of our methods you know will be available and if you need more information on the process we're happy to add that. I don't know if there's going to be any discussion with the actual committee, you know, advisory committee that we worked with. I think they have a lot of great insight. As Eve mentioned, um, after each process, we do an act after action process with not only staff, but with the committee. because so we want to hear, you know, how can we improve things? What did you like? What worked best? So I think that um, our committee has a lot of insight as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, Martha Field. So I had a quick question about the, uh, the, the scientific methodologies because that sort of weaves almost through all three of the, of the questions. And so I could imagine that the methodologies might have differed slightly in terms of the sort of quality of the evidence base among or between, I guess, among the many guidelines. So will we be provided that information or it occurred to me when you were presenting, is that already available on Nesser? So can we readily access that data and can we understand how decisions were made around when to use existing reviews and when to do new ones? 
I'm going to say, and um, well, I'm going to say, I know our nutrition evidence systematic review team is listening. Um, I'm going to say, I, I, um, I wonder if there's just a summary. I think you could pull it together from what's available on the website. Um, you know, what reviews have been done. We have uh, the historical archived reviews that have been done. Um, we initiated the NEL at the time for the 2010 guidelines. Um, prior to that, we didn't have a formal systematic review entity. Uh, so 2010, we had reviews. 2015, we um, conducted systematic reviews as well as 2020. So that information is there, um, but it might be helpful for us to prepare some type of summary document with a comparison over time. Um, so I think we could definitely do that. It might be helpful to kind of outline how we might do it and try to get that to y'all for reaction before pulling it together because it might be a pretty big um, you know, might be a pretty big undertaking. So, but I think, yes, it's there, but if, if there's something that we can do to make that more manageable, I think, um, you know, we certainly have the knowledge of where all the pieces are that we could probably do that. It would be, really helpful. Helpful. It would be really helpful if you did that. We are particularly interested in um, questions about that relate to the sort of the status of the systematic review. Um, was it something that was done with a technical expert panel in advance in response to, let's say, the B24 or PB24 project? Um, and was it, did it have a um, external review? Did it go to full publication? Um, is it something that was suggested by the committee in the course of its, pro if, of its process? What's its publication status now? Um, sort of a, 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 an assessment of the review quality. And, and we, the committee recognizes that now made this transformation to Nesser across this whole thing, beginning with the PB to 24 project, with the kinds of review questions that were developed there. They needed to make them things that they could do. Then there were other questions that you folks must have determined. So I, I guess we're wanting to know like who came up with the question, what level of um, process did it have? Um, given the time frame, we recognize that there were many reviews that were not going to uh, get out the door for external review in time for meeting your needs. Um, so we're, we're wanting to have a sense of that. Um, and those are not deep questions. That's kind of a check off grid in some ways. It would help us know where to look if we wanted to look further. Um, would anyone on the committee like to ask for anything else on this subject? Can I just add like a summary bullet for the systematic reviews? I mean, for the work that was done with this committee, they were all original systematic reviews. So there were no like existing reviews pulled in. So that was done in 2015. And the benefit of this was consistent methodology. I mean, all of the methods were the rigorous methods, you know, working with this advisory committee. And as you alluded to, there were um, PB24 um, systematic reviews that were pulled in. And that was a major project, you know, that was also with the technical expert collaborative. And a few of those members um, were also on the advisory committee. So there was crossover, but we're happy to provide more information. And as Eve mentioned, all of this um, systematic reviews are on nesser.gov. So you could see the conclusion statements and the grading. So they're all graded. So the quality of evidence with the description um, of the grading, the thoughts of the committee as to why things were graded a certain way. So it's very detailed information, um, but if needed, we could produce like a high level summary mm -hmm. of the findings. Thank yeah. you. In, in thinking about that, um, I'm looking at the Nesser website and the one thing it doesn't have for me is the publication date, like when that review was completed. We have, there's the inclusion exclusion date 
um, and it doesn't tell me when the study started. So if we're thinking about changes over time, in addition to the questions that Kathleen asked, you know, what the inclusion exclusion dates were, um, what kinds of study designs were, were considered to be appropriate, um, what were the study populations it, that were kind of for each of those. I know it's on the website, but to pull all that, like you said, it's clicking through all that stuff, if there is a way to pull that, um, and then whether or not there was an external technical panel, um, who, who determined the question, when was it identified, and whether it was peer reviewed prior. And we could provide like a list of questions. And if there would be some way to diagram it in, in the time frames, which one started by the start date or something like that, and then just little symbols on there so we could just scan it, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, I'd like to come back with a question for Janet um, or maybe Eve also. Uh, task three really is quite speculative. It's about should have. And um, the research on should have is pretty difficult. Um, do you have an insight into what Congress is wanting or what you think might be feasible to answer a should have question? So this is... Um, I'm trying to get to which question. Yeah, I totally know. This is a, an analysis of how full implementation of the recommendations described oh. in paragraph one, which is the study, would have affected the most recently issued guidance. Mm -hmm. We totally understand what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, I think we are very much like here's a study and or you know here's the a systematic review found what you base the what on what was in the articles and it, it is a totally different type of question for us too. So um, I will say for this uh, in Dr. Asmussen, this was we don't have information or um, a lot of or I don't think we have much information around the cost associated with our production of this edition of the guidelines. Perhaps it's, a, you know, if we outline kind of the timeline that we had, the cost that we had, um, I know it is a, there's, it's really hard to know, like, um, how much would it have cost if something had been def done differently? I mean, it's all, um, it's a difficult ask. So well, it I will say- it isn't, it isn't just cost, it's also, um, you had a different sized committee. Yeah. Um, because you had a different sized committee, you could have different kinds of expertise. Um, the persons chosen had things that they were interested in and that led to new reviews. There are cases where you could, could see that. Um, those are also ways that, uh, features on which you could speculate there were things that might have been different. Um, I think it would be helpful to us if you and Janet would give some thought to um, any ideas you, you might have in um, thinking about issues that might be relevant. But clearly the committee has some ideas of its own and um, we've only just begun to meet. So we are not done having ideas of our own, um, but you may also have ideas. Um, so I'll let you just put those in your bonnets and think about them for a while. Uh, Bruce, you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, is there any sense of what recommendations were considered and are planned to be implemented later, but for whatever reason, couldn't be implemented at the time, and, but there's a plan later on? If we could get a sense of that, that might be helpful as well. Definitely. And I think the, the final recommendation around future directions um, is one that um, is something that we have continued to put in request to have funding to support um, systems modeling. Um, so doing that kind of that seventh guideline is one where that is something that is really a future forward versus for this latest edition of the guidelines. Um, but I, in the, what, we're working on, I think we can try to speak to where we are now. And I mean, the study, the specific, um, I guess, uh, request around the study is for comparing to the 2020 process, but we can allude to kind of this is where we are now. And this is, 
what we're how we're talking about it as we move ahead. Um, so, yes, I, I I would say across the board um, we did kind of have that. This is what we're doing 2020 and kind of looking ahead, just because of where we were in the process when the 2017 uh, NASIM reports came out. So that leads to another question. Um, so the prior report laid out a five-year timeline. And as you just mentioned and said in your presentation, the report was issued in the middle of that timeline. The subsequent dietary guidelines have been issued and now we're um, uh, eight months into the next five-year period. So the committee is wondering what our time frame is. There seem to be two options. One is that you terminated at the issuance of the guidelines, and the other is you carry forward to the present because there's the opportunity to see then how USDA and HHS are responding to the recommendation that you start early um, and, and what things that you put in place that will have a long-term effect if you start earlier. Um, it doesn't seem, the the language from Congress and the questions asked are silent on which of those sort of time blocks you might be using. Um, and so any thoughts you'd like to offer us would be welcome. I think the intent was really around ending with the release of the latest edition of the guidelines. Um, I think that's when, but, I mean, because the way just it's framing around um, kind of we hit, hit this point at the release of this edition. Um, so I don't know, Janet, if you have um, other thoughts, but I think the kind of timeline that was intended, it was around for the process for the 2020, 2025 guidelines. And that ended with the release of that edition. And now we're moving into the next one. Um, so I, I kind of would envision the end being the release of the guidelines and potentially a little bit around the implementation or you know that next piece of, but really with the 2020 edition. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, as far as timeline, yeah, we were definitely in a timeline crunch this round, you know, with, you know, we were waiting for these reports um, and there were a lot of, you know, outside issues. So we definitely want, we're already starting. We've started pretty much in January. So planning and, and working on the process and we're really excited about some um, enhancements to the process that we'd be happy to share with you to help streamline scientific review and some other work. So I have another question that relates to my experience with the WIC committee and that that did the food packagery uh, revisions where a major uh, challenge was getting data from NHANES that was actually adequate for our task. And there is quite a bit of data analysis that was done from NHANES as part of this. Um, and none of that's mentioned in these tasks, but it's certainly part of the processes. Is there any way to um, get a handle on what kind and how much work um, was done as using data from NHANES and how well or poorly that went? Because it's part of the DGA process. Yeah, I can just start off saying we have a, a data, a federal data analysis team, and we start working with them well in advance, you know, of working with the committee. So we have um, all of the you know, data needs. Um, we work very closely with NHANES staff and we share you know, what updated information we need. And they also share with us like where they are in their cycle because it's not always consistent as to when you know, the scientific report is published. But we absolutely work hand in hand with them. Um, and also um, you know, NIH is part of the data analysis team as well, you know, deciding you know, if there's enough data in certain populations. I mean, as you probably know, the, the infant toddler breastfeeding population was really tricky. Um, and now yeah. you know, with, with COVID, you know, we've, had a, we've missed you know, a year of data. So that's gonna be a challenge. But yes, it is a very big undertaking that's probably not as clear. I mean, if you look at chapter one of the 
advisory committee report, the data analysis, I mean, it's like the largest, I think it's chapter one. Um, you could see how in depth it is. So that's a lot of the work um, that is done with our federal agencies. So we'd be happy to provide more information, but we're absolutely dependent on um, in Haines and we also work with um, NCI on like food intake analysis and USDA as well. So it's a really in-depth, wonderful federal team that we have working on data. So we would be interested in insights you have as to whether this process um, went smoothly, if you had what you needed or you didn't have what you needed, if it came on time or it didn't, that kind of thing would be helpful for us to understand. And it varies cl clearly by population if you're looking for about a 20 year window for an adult age. Um, and Haynes is designed to sample that, but it's not designed to sample the, the one year window for toddlers. Uh, John, sure. I have a question. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on implementation and your understanding of implementation, whether it's simply a, uh, well, is it described in the materials online? what you did for implementation? And then um, is it really a description of a plan for implementation or is it really the actual implementation and the effect of the implementation uh, is what I'm trying to sort of get my arms around right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I'll say that, well, first, the. Um, if we're thinking about the comparative analysis, the, the first committee second report, the seven recommendations, none of them mention implementation. Um, so just kind of, if we're thinking about how the departments went about the implementation piece, um, I have to think about where that fits within kind of that second report, thinking about our process in that second report. Um, I will say that that, that first study was really on the process for developing versus the implementation of the guidelines. Um, and certainly, I think everyone on this call would agree we'd love greater implementation of healthy eating patterns. So um, that, that could be its own committee, I think. Um, so I think if there's a way, I, I just a, I think, um, that's not in those seven recommendations. If, you, if there's a way that you see it as a part of those recommendations, we're happy to you know, share information about um, what we do in terms of implementation. But the first study was really around the process to develop the recommendations versus the implementation of them. So um, we have time for one last question. If the committee doesn't have, members of the committee don't have one, I do. So last call for committee questions. Okay. Um, so one of the recommendations was more transparency about any disconnect between the DGAC report and what was published. And mostly what we've seen is related to alcohol. Are you aware of other disconnects and is there a way to inventory those and have a look at them? So there were two recommendations where the committee rate made a recommendation for a quantitative change um, and that was added sugars and alcoholic beverages. Um, I will say that the guidelines do carry forward the recommendation to limit both of those, um, but the specific, some specific quantitative shifts, the ultimate dietary guidelines um, did not make those shifts. There is a page on our website at the uh, dietaryguidelines.gov slash national academies that does provide a, a rationale for not integrating those two pieces. Mm -hmm. And we did have, um, staff who did go through the committee's recommendations. I think something that um, this committee did more so than I think some of our uh, the most recent committees was really did in the in the summary sections of their chapters, they really did outline their recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, and we did have staff go through and identify those recommendations and um, if they were integrated into the final guidance. And I will 
follow up on the specific number, I think it was like 95% of those statements were carried forward in, or the intent of those recommendations were carried forward in the ultimate guidelines with the exception of those two quantitative pieces. So um, I think that can be part of what we share, but the two things that, and those are the alcohol and added sugars are the ones that, um, um, that was, you know, as you noted, were discussed the most, but those really are the two. Um, wow. The vast majority of the recommendations, um, everything else was carried forward. Right. So as a member of the public, it was hard for me to tell whether there was a reporter who was interested in sugar and somebody else who was interested in alcohol and those what came to people's attention. Because what's lost in the reporting that went on is that the rest of them were very similar. So um, having having some understanding of that would be helpful to us in the material that you're presenting to us. That's a great flag. And I think that's totally fair that those got it. But in large, if you look at the broad scheme of it, it's it's very consistent. Well, now we know, which we didn't before. <laughs> Um, we would like to uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry there wasn't time for questions from um, others. Uh, we are look, looking forward to the things that you are preparing for us. And as we move forward in the next week or so, I'm sure there's more we will ask you for, but uh, we are only at the barest beginning of our process at the moment. So with that, I will say um, thank you to our guests and adjourn our public session.